helicopter prison breaks, forgery disguise, or pure wit. None of these things were off limits for daring inmates who escaped prison and shocked the world. Discover the minds behind these baffling plans and the extraordinary lengths they went to for a taste of freedom. Does love make us do foolish things? Perhaps the story of French bank robber Michel Vaujour and his wife Nadine will help set the matter straight. It was 1985 when Michel Vaujour's illegal exploits came to an abrupt halt. He had always lived on the edge of legality. Born into a life of crime, he became a seasoned bank robber by the 1980s. That is, until he was apprehended and convicted of bank robbery and attempted murder. As a result, Michel was sentenced to 18 years in prison. This would have been the end for most criminals, but not for Michel. The man was no stranger to prisons or to escaping from them. And Michel had a very important asset. His wife, Nadine Vaujour, who was willing to do anything for the man she loved. To Michel, the sentence likely seemed like little more than a temporary inconvenience. He knew what he had to do, find a plan, execute it, and then enjoy the sweetness of freedom. As such, Michel had begun planning his escape even before his trial. Nadine Vaujour, Michel's wife, was as committed to his escape as he was. She was more than willing to take action and dive headfirst into the criminal world for her husband's sake. As soon as Michel was imprisoned, Nadine began preparing herself to help Michel escape from the Parisian prison de la Sante. It wasn't long before she became a familiar face at a helicopter rental company in southern Paris. Always paying in cash, she regularly rented helicopters for practice, never raising enough suspicion for the authorities to catch on to her true intentions. Over the course of several months, she and Michel began to put together their bold escape plan, though it would require even more ingenuity than first imagined. Inside Prison de la Santé, Michel formed a close friendship and a strategic partnership with fellow inmate Pierre Hernandez. Together, they spent their days scouting the prison for a landing spot for the helicopter. Soon after, they realized none existed. Instead of landing, Nadine would have to hover the helicopter over the prison, allowing Michel and Pierre to scramble up a rope or line to freedom. Michel, undeterred, continued to fine-tune the operation. As Nadine focused on learning how to fly a helicopter, Michael worked on devising a clever distraction, an instrumental part of any prison escape. Months passed, and finally, the big day was upon them. On May 26, 1986, at approximately 10.30 a.m., Nadine Vaujour flew a helicopter low over the rooftops of Paris, heading toward the prison. Desperate radio warnings tried to get her to stop and return, but Nadine successfully ignored them all focused on one thing and one thing only, freeing her beloved husband. She brought the helicopter to a hovering stop over the roof of one of the prison buildings. Inside, Michel and Pierre executed the rest of their plan flawlessly. It was mayhem inside the prison where guards believed the two inmates were armed with grenades. Every time one of the guards tried to approach them, Michel and Pierre threatened to detonate the grenades. In reality, there were no grenades. They were nothing more than nectarines painted green. But as long as the guards didn't know the truth, Michel and Pierre were free to make their escape. The guards, fearing a potential explosion, hesitated, allowing the men to make their way to the helicopter without interference. Michel and Pierre made their way to the roof. However, at the last moment, Pierre Hernandez chose to surrender, leaving Michel to climb the rope alone. Once inside the helicopter, Michel and Nadine fled to a nearby athletic field where they had arranged a getaway vehicle. For more than three months, the couple lived in marital bliss, even managing to collect their two daughters under the noses of the police. They lay low in Paris, the city of Michel's imprisonment, but the lure of crime proved too strong. The Vaujour embarked on a string of bank robberies in the city, leading to their eventual downfall. Michel was shot in the head during a shootout with police, but survived, emerging from a coma weeks later. Michel returned to prison, where he served several more years. He attempted another escape but failed. In 2003, Michel Vaujour was granted his freedom after 27 years in prison. His later life saw a shift in focus, turning toward spirituality, writing, and self-reflection. Nadine, after serving her sentence, disappeared from public view. Their infamous helicopter escape, however, remains one of the most incredible prison breaks in history, a testament to audacity, love, and criminal ingenuity. In September 2012, Choi Gapbak was no stranger to incarceration. 
The 49-year-old from South Korea was a career thief with an incredible skill. He had spent a total of 23 years of his life behind bars. Throughout these years, he cultivated a unique ability practicing yoga. He was a master of the practice. And in 2012, he decided to use his immense skills in his pursuit of freedom. Choi was the head of a theft ring and had a history of escaping from police custody. Upon his latest arrest, Choi was transported to a police station in Daegu where he was held in a small cell. This was a familiar environment for the career thief who had learned to bide his time during prior incarcerations. What the arresting officers did not foresee, however, was that Choi had a plan that would leverage his years of yoga practice. For five days, Choi waited patiently, carefully waiting for the perfect opportunity to set his plan and his body in motion. The moment finally came on September 17, 2012. It was early in the morning and the officers on duty were asleep. First, the man grabbed his pillows and arranged them under his blanket to make it look as if he were sleeping. Then he made his move. The food slot at the bottom of his cell door was a mere 5.9 inches tall and 17.7 inches wide. No normal person thinks they could use such a small space as a means to escape. But 5'4 Choi Gapbok was no normal person. For him, the obstacle was manageable. He coated his upper body with lotion to reduce friction, then went to work. First, his head slipped through, followed by his right arm and shoulders. Then the rest of his body followed. Within less than a minute, Choi was out of his cell, moving past the sleeping officers and escaping through a window. Once outside the station, Choi made his way to a nearby residence where he stole car keys and a credit card. The police soon realized what had happened and immediately set up checkpoints in the area. However, Choi, demonstrating quick thinking and resourcefulness, abandoned the stolen car just a few hundred meters before a checkpoint and disappeared into the wilderness of Mount Nam. A manhunt involving helicopters, tracking dogs, and hundreds of police officers was launched. But Choi remained elusive for the next two days, moving stealthily through the mountainous terrain, hiding by day and traveling only under the cover of night. He continued to evade the police, eventually reaching the town of Miryang. There, a vigilant soldier on a bus recognized him and reported the sighting to the authorities. Choi, ever calculating, feigned motion sickness and convinced the bus driver to let him off at a stop near the village of Hanum Yup. The police closed in on the area, finding traces of the fugitive, including a note left in the house of a local farmer. The note, which read, I am sorry, was signed by Choi, who continued to insist that he was framed. After six days on the run, Choi was finally located on September 22, 2012. He had been hiding on the roof of an apartment building in Miryang, inside a cardboard box. Upon his arrest, he continued to proclaim his innocence, insisting that he had been framed for his crimes. But the police didn't want to take any chances with the escape artist who could move his body with the flexibility of an octopus. They escorted a barefoot Choi back to the same police station in Daegu, this time placing him in a cell with no bars and a food slot significantly smaller than the one through which he had previously escaped. Though the manhunt had finally come to an end, Choi Gapbok's story of escape remained a testament to the length some individuals will go in their defiance of captivity. It was 1971 and Frank Abagnale, an already notorious con man, was arrested and taken to prison. It should have been the end of his criminal career, except for the fact that Frank managed to escape, or rather, he managed to literally walk out of prison with nobody stopping him. This escape cemented his status as a legendary con artist, even though recent sources claim that Frank's stories were never true at all. Has Frank conned everyone into thinking he was the biggest con man? According to the man himself, Frank Abagnale Jr.'s criminal career began at an incredibly young age. By 15, he had already embarked on a path of deception that would span continents. Born in 1948, Frank's primary method was check fraud, a scheme that allowed him to travel freely often posing as someone he was not. Frank was particularly fond of impersonating professionals, pilots, doctors, lawyers, and even government agents. By 21, he had amassed a reputation as one of the most skilled con men in the world. His fraudulent activities took him across several countries, and Frank became an expert at evading authorities. He posed as a Pan American World Airways pilot, deadheading on over two million air miles by hopping on flights under the guise of being part of the crew. He also claimed to have served as an assistant state attorney general in Louisiana and as a physician at a Georgia hospital. 
While many of these claims have since been questioned, with some exposed as exaggerations or fabrications, they contributed to the mystique surrounding him during his time as a fugitive. By 1971, after years of running from the law, Frank was finally apprehended. He had already served time in both French and Swedish prisons, spending six months in each before being extradited to the United States. His crimes, particularly in the realm of check forgery, had caught up with him, and he was sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. It was time for Frank to say goodbye to his criminal activities and repent for his crimes, except he had other plans. Not only was Frank an exceptionally skilled manipulator, he was also a lucky person. The story of his escape began with a simple clerical error. While being transferred to the U.S. penitentiary in Atlanta by a U.S. marshal, the officer in charge of Frank forgot a crucial document, his detention commitment papers. This seemingly minor oversight would become the foundation of Frank's latest deception. When the prison administration noticed the missing paperwork, they were unsure of his true identity. Sensing an opportunity, Frank concocted a scheme that would exploit the confusion. Using his charm and well-spoken nature, Frank Abagnale convinced the prison guards that he was not a regular inmate, but rather an undercover prison inspector sent by the FBI to evaluate conditions inside the facility. The guards, likely used to dealing with less sophisticated criminals, believed him. They began treating him with a level of respect typically reserved for law enforcement personnel, allowing him privileges not afforded to regular prisoners. The con artist's next step involved the help of his close friend, Gene Sebring. He contacted the woman who posed as an undercover journalist conducting an investigation on prisons. Together, they devised a plan to solidify Frank's false identity. Gene doctored the business card of an actual FBI agent, Joe Shea, and altered it to include Frank's name. She also managed to forge a prison inspector's ID card. Armed with these falsified documents, Frank was ready to make his move. One day, he approached the guards, flashed his false FBI credentials, and informed them that he needed to speak with the agent listed on his business card. Unbelievably, the guards complied and called the number provided. Gene Sebring answered, posing as the agent. She instructed the guards that Frank needed to be released temporarily to meet with her outside the prison. The guards allegedly claimed they'd known all along that Frank was an FBI agent. They opened the gates and allowed him to walk out of the penitentiary. Frank Abadnale was once again a free man, at least for a while. He was apprehended again just a few weeks later when he passed by an unmarked police car and the officers recognized him. It was April 2012 and Ronaldo Silva, a 39-year-old suspected drug trafficker from Brazil, was in prison in his home country. But the man didn't want to stick around for long. Instead, he had a plan and he was sure it would work, no matter how ridiculous it seemed. Since usual methods of escaping had failed him before, Ronaldo had come up with an extraordinary plan. Ronaldo Silva, known for his alleged involvement in drug trafficking, had a history of attempting to evade the law. His criminal activities eventually led to his incarceration, where he awaited trial on serious charges. Just a month before, armed men attempted to storm a different prison to rescue him. However, that escape plan was foiled, resulting in Ronaldo's transfer to a new facility where he was kept under closer surveillance. Yet this change in location did not deter him from devising another escape attempt, this time through deception rather than brute force. It was during a family visit from his wife that his escape plan took place. After entering the facility for a visit, Ronaldo and his wife exchanged clothes. She left the prison wearing his shorts and a different top. As for Ronaldo, he donned his wife's blue dress. He put on a long-haired wig, a bra, and a pair of high heels. He had even shaved his legs and arms, fully committing to the disguise. Painted nails and bright red lipstick completed the transformation, allowing Silva to blend in with the crowd of inmates' wives, leaving the facility after visiting hours. And it almost worked. Ronaldo managed to get past the guards at the prison gates. After all, he looked like a woman. But as Ronaldo walked towards a bus stop just outside prison gates, it quickly became noticeable that he didn't walk like a woman. His awkward walk immediately attracted the attention of a patrolling policeman. Suspicious of the woman struggling to walk, the policeman decided to follow Silva. As Silva neared the bus stop, where two men on motorbikes were waiting to pick him up, the policeman approached and confronted him. Upon closer inspection, the policeman realized that the woman 
was actually Silva in disguise. The inmate was promptly arrested and returned to the prison before he could escape on the waiting motorbike. Silva's second attempt at breaking free was over, and the disguise that almost secured his freedom was exposed. In the aftermath, prison officials acknowledged the elaborate effort Silva had put into his disguise and escape plan. Carlos Welber, the prison director, remarked on the amount of preparation and premeditation involved in the scheme. Silva had meticulously crafted his appearance, hoping to deceive the prison staff and slip away unnoticed. However, the prison has since implemented stricter security measures to prevent future incidents, particularly during visiting hours when the prison is most vulnerable. In January 1995, Andrew Roger, Keith Rose, and Matthew Williams were all serving life sentences at H.M. Prison Parkhurst. The three men were friends and together they hatched a plan that would become one of the most infamous prison escapes in British history. The trio shared a common goal but came from diverse criminal backgrounds. Andrew Roger had been incarcerated since 1987 for the brutal murder of a swimming pool attendant, a crime committed with a crowbar. Keith Rose, convicted in 1991, was behind bars for the equally heinous murder of a woman. The third member of the group, Matthew Williams, was serving time for multiple offenses including arson and bomb making. Though their crimes differed, the three men found common ground in their shared desire to escape Parkhurst's confines. Parkhurst Prison, once one of the toughest jails in the United Kingdom, had fallen into disrepair and dysfunction by the mid-1990s. By 1995, the prison was riddled with corruption, drug use, and an overall lack of discipline. Ongoing construction work at the facility had disrupted routines and fostered a sense of instability, while prison staff were poorly trained and often inattentive. Inmates like Roger, Rose, and Williams used the chaos to their advantage, knowing full well that their movements were largely unnoticed. The trio crafted their escape plan with great precision. They spent long hours in the prison's metal shop, taking advantage of the lack of supervision. Rose, a skilled sheet metal worker, used his talents to fabricate the tools necessary for the escape. They constructed a makeshift ladder from goalposts, forged a key by memory that replicated one used by prison officers, and even crafted a gun loaded with blank ammunition. No one seemed to notice. No one raised the alarm. The prison guards were oblivious to the impending break. On January 3, 1995, the three men made their move. Under the cover of darkness, they stayed behind in the prison gym after the evening exercise session. Guards failed to notice that only seven of the ten men who had entered the gym returned to their cells. Using the key they had forged, Roger, Rose, and Williams quietly made their way through several doors, retrieving the tools they had prepared. Their final hurdle was the prison's 25-foot perimeter wall, which they scaled using their homemade ladder after cutting through a mesh fence. Unbelievably, no one noticed their escape. Guards were either distracted or untrained, and the security technology was outdated, leaving vast areas of the prison unmonitored. Once outside the prison, the trio headed to Newport wearing civilian clothes. From there, they took a taxi to Sandown, aiming to steal a plane and flee the island. Rose, the designated pilot, had planned to fly a small Cessna 105 trainer aircraft. However, the plane proved unsuitable for their needs. Designed for only two people, it would not have been able to take off with all three men on board. Further complicating matters, the group could not start the engine as they lacked the proper cockpit key, and Rose's improvised methods failed when the metal piece he was using broke off inside the lock. Realizing their plan had gone awry, the men sought refuge in the woods, but by this point, authorities had discovered the escape. For two days, the fugitives evaded capture, but on January 8th, an off-duty prison officer spotted them walking along a road. Roger and Rose were quickly apprehended while Williams managed to flee temporarily before being caught two hours later. Their escape ended in failure, but it exposed the severe flaws in Parkhurst's security, prompting a wave of reforms across the prison system. 